By the end of this video, you'll know how to use the Sketch Dimension tool in Fusion 360. The Sketch Dimension tool can be activated from the Sketch drop-down list, where you'll find it at the very bottom of the list. It can also be activated with the keyboard shortcut letter D as in Delta. You can activate it from the right-click Sketch menu in the Sketch Flyout folder. And lastly, from the Marking menu, by right-clicking, selecting the Sketch menu at the bottom, and then by dragging your mouse directly to the left. It's important to note that the Sketch Dimension tool should not be confused with the Measuring tool, which you'll see in the toolbar, or in the Inspect drop-down list. The Measure tool is solely for inspecting the dimensions of your model, not adding dimensions. To follow along with this tutorial, you'll want to grab the free demo file on my website. To check it out, go to productdesignonline.com forward slash number six. That's productdesignonline.com forward slash number six and that URL will automatically redirect to the page with the demo file and some additional resources. I'll now hit the keyboard shortcut letter D as in Delta to activate the Sketch Dimension tool. You'll follow the same workflow every time you need to create a new Sketch Dimension. First, simply click on the Sketch Geometry that you would like to dimension. I'll click on the bottom line. Then, as I drag my mouse cursor away from the line, you'll notice the sketch dimension appears. To place the dimension, you'll need to click with your mouse, which then immediately opens the dimension input field. At this point, I can either type out a numerical value, or I can simply click the Enter key if the dimension is already set to the desired value. You can also type out equations and a few other things in the dimension input fields, so be sure to stick around to the very end where I'll demo seven sketch dimension tricks that will make you a pro when adding dimensions. For now, I'm going to hit the Enter key on my keyboard to place the dimension. If you want to move your dimensions around at any time, you'll simply need to click anywhere on the dimension line and then you can drag the dimension around. Notice how the dimension value follows my mouse cursor around as I move from side to side, giving you the ability to place the value in a better location, which comes in handy when you have dimensions running into each other. After creating a dimension, the Sketch Dimension tool will remain active, which is indicated by the Sketch Dimension icon next to the cursor. This lets you quickly create another dimension without having to reactivate the command each time. Otherwise, you can hit the Escape key on your keyboard to clear out the command. For the first dimension example, I simply clicked on the bottom line. However, another common use case for adding sketch dimensions would be selecting two points and then dimensioning the distance between the two points. I'm going to click on this left middle corner of the geometry, and then I'll click on the corner where the circle meets the horizontal line. Watch what happens as I drag my mouse cursor around. You'll notice there are three different ways that I could dimension the distance between these two points. I could dimension the width, the height, or the angle. For now, I'll simply drag straight up and I'll click to create the distance between these two points. I'm going to type out 15 millimeters and then I'll hit the Enter key on my keyboard. Now you may have noticed that the line on the right hand side updated as well. This is because of the constraints that are currently applied to this sketch which leads me to one of the most important practices when creating sketch dimensions. In general, as you dimension sketch geometry, you want to consider how you can dimension your sketches 
with the fewest amount of dimensions as possible. In order to do this, you'll have to apply constraints to your sketches. So it's very important that you understand how to constrain your sketches. Click that info icon in the upper right hand corner to watch a video on sketch constraints. I'll also add the video to the resource page for this tutorial. Let's now quickly take a look at an example of this. Notice how there are two small circles on this sketch that appear to be the same size. If I wanted to ensure that the circles were always the same size, then the best practice would not be to dimension each circle as the same dimension. I would actually want to first add the equal constraint to the circles and then I can dimension only one of them. I'm going to hold down the shift key on my keyboard and then I'll select the small circle on the left and I'll select the small circle on the right. Once they're both selected, I'll select the equal constraint icon in the sketch palette. Or if you're in the new UI, then you can select the equal constraint up here in the toolbar. You'll see that each circle now has an equal constraint next to it. I'll now hit the keyboard shortcut letter D as in Delta to activate the dimension tool. Then I'll click on the left circle and I'll click once again to set the dimension. Finally, I'll type out 10 millimeters for the circle's dimension. Now pay close attention to what happens to the circle on the right hand side as I hit the enter key on my keyboard to place this dimension. You'll notice the circle on the right updated to 10 millimeters as well because of the equal constraints. To summarize why this is so important, imagine being able to change only a handful of dimensions to update dimensions all across your model versus updating a dimension for every single piece of sketch geometry that is in your model. As you can imagine, more complex sketches could start to get out of control and it would be hard to keep track of all the dimensions. That is why it is so crucial that you attempt to use sketch constraints first and then apply the fewest amount of dimensions possible, which drive the sketch. At this point, we've taken a look at how to dimension the diameter of the circles and the linear lines. Let's now take a look at how to dimension angles between the lines. With the dimension tool still active, I'll select the left vertical line and then I'll select the adjacent line. As I drag my mouse cursor out, you'll notice that it creates a degree input field for the angle. Notice how I can dimension this angle in four different directions based on the lines of this sketch geometry. I'm going to click on the inside of this obtuse angle to make it a bit larger. I'll type out 145 degrees and then I'll hit the enter key on my keyboard. This time, you may have noticed that the right side did not automatically update and that's because there are no constraints applied that are forcing that to happen. So again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of adding constraints before dimensioning. You can add constraints after dimensions, but you'll find it to be more efficient to add them all at the very beginning. Next, let's take a look at defining the radius of an arc. I'll make sure the sketch dimension tool is still active and then I'll click on the arc at the top of this sketch. After I click to place this dimension and hit the enter key to set the radius, You'll notice there is the letter R in front of the numerical value. The letter R stands for radius, whereas the circle symbol below stands for the diameter of the circle. The arcs will always default to be dimensioned by their radius along with sketch fillets. Contrary, circles will always be dimensioned by their diameter. So keep this in mind as you create sketch dimensions, as it can be easy to type out the diameter when you're really applying the radius or vice versa. 
Now that you know how to apply a variety of sketch dimensions, it's important to note that all of these dimension types are parametric, meaning you can change the dimensions at any time. To edit a dimension, simply double click on the dimension to open it back up. Then type out a new value before hitting the enter key on your keyboard. I'll double click on the dimension for the small circle. I'll type out 12 millimeters for the new value and then I'll hit the enter key on my keyboard. You can update dimensions at any time as you work on your model, letting your model adapt to the changes in your requirements. Now that you're familiar with the sketch dimension basics, let's take a look at seven tricks that will make you a pro at creating sketch dimensions in Fusion 360. Before we get started, I'll quickly point out that I've added all of these on the resource page for this tutorial, so you can bookmark the page and quickly reference them later on. If you remember earlier, I pointed out the arc had a radius dimension by default, and the circle had a diameter dimension by default. For pro tip number one, I'll show you how to change each dimension type to one or the other. I'll right click on the radius dimension that was applied to the top arc. Then I'll click on the option that says toggle diameter. You'll now see the arc has the diameter applied and Fusion 360 automatically doubled the radius value, leaving us with the same dimension. Of course, to switch from a diameter dimension to a radius dimension, you'll simply need to follow the same steps to select the toggle radius option. Pro tip number two is that you can hide or show your sketch dimensions. To hide your sketch dimensions, simply click the checkbox in the sketch palette. If it's unchecked, then your dimensions will be hidden. And of course, if the box is checked, then your sketch dimensions will be visible. The ability to hide dimensions can come in handy if you're trying to work solely with constraints or to fine tune details of busy sketch geometry. You'll also notice just below the dimension option that you can toggle sketch constraints on and off as well. Pro tip number three is that you can create driven dimensions. Up to this point in the tutorial, we've been creating driving dimensions, meaning that they drive the shape or size of the sketch geometry based on the values we input. Contrary, you can create driven dimensions, which are the dimensions used simply for reference purposes. In other words, they won't alter the sketch geometry, but they themselves will be updated as you change the driving dimensions. I'll activate the sketch dimension tool, and then I'll click on the center circle, and I'll click on the outer arc. Now before I click to place the dimension, I'm going to right click in order to select the driven option from the list. Then I'll click to place the driven dimension. Notice how this dimension has parentheses around it, signifying it's a driven dimension. In this example, I've added the driven dimension to show the distance between the circle and the arc. This way, if I add a dimension to the circle, and then if I update the circle's dimension, the driven dimension will update accordingly, showing me the current distance of the gap at any given time without actually altering the dimension of the gap. An important thing to note with driven dimensions is that sometimes you'll be warned that they will be automatically applied. For example, if you remember earlier in this lesson, we added equal constraints to the small circles, so we only needed to dimension the one on the left hand side. You may find that you want to apply a driven dimension to the circle on the right hand side, so you're reminded that the circle has the same dimension. 
However, this is by no means something that is required or necessary. Notice as I try to add a driving dimension that Fusion 360 warns me that the dimension will be driven instead. I'll simply click the OK button to add the driven dimension to the circle on the right. Pro tip number four is that the dimensions are automatically numbered. You'll notice as I hover over a dimension that the dimension has a number applied to it. This dimension number can be used in the input field of other dimensions. If I hover over the 15 millimeter dimension on the left, you'll see there is a number right after the letter D. I'll use this as a way to create a dimension for the smaller line. I'll click on the small line and then I'll type out the letter D in its number value, as well as the division symbol and the number two. This will set this dimension to be half of the 15 millimeter dimension while ensuring that it always references this other dimension. This is why you'll see the function symbol, or fx, before this newly created dimension. Pro tip number five is that you can create equations within the dimension input fields. Now we just saw an example of this on a very basic level by calling the dimension number and dividing it by two. However, it's important to note that we can type out any legitimate equation within the input fields. For example, if I double click on the 100 millimeter dimension at the bottom, I can type out the following equation in the input field. I'll type out two plus three plus five in parentheses, the asterisk or time symbol, and then four plus six in parentheses, and then the asterisk symbol, and then the number one. Notice how when I hit the enter key on my keyboard that the equation equals 100. Now obviously there's no reason to enter equations if you know the value of your dimension. However, equations can be extremely helpful if you only know other dimensions of the model. Simply type out a relevant equation and let Fusion 360 do the math for you. Pro tip number six is that you can use any user parameter values within the input fields to make your model more dynamic. I have a few other videos where I demo this with dynamic models, and I'll add those videos to the resource page for this tutorial. For now, I'll quickly create a user parameter value of height that is equal to 40 millimeters. Then I'll create a new dimension on the left hand side and I'll type out the user parameter of height. As I hit the enter key on my keyboard, you'll see that the function symbol appears before the expression of the user parameter. Anytime that I now update the user parameter, the dimension will be updated accordingly, and the user parameter can be reused in multiple dimension fields. Last but not least, pro tip number seven is that you can rename sketch dimensions. To rename sketch dimensions, you'll need to open the change parameters dialog. I'll select the change parameters icon in the toolbar. Then I'm going to toggle open the file name folder and the sketch folder. You'll then see that all the dimensions have automatically been added to this list. From there, you can edit the dimension name instead of its default number. The benefits of this is that it can be easier to remember instead of keeping track of all the dimension numbers. I'll simply click on the first dimension we created and I'll rename this by typing out bottom line in camel case. Then I'll click the enter key and I'll close the parameters dialog box by hitting the blue OK button. If I now hover over the bottom dimension, you'll notice that the dimension name now appears instead of D1. To summarize this sketch dimension tutorial, 
you'll want to remember that the most important takeaway is that you should always use the fewest amount of dimensions possible per each sketch. Always start by adding constraints before dimensions. Be sure to check out productdesignonline.com forward slash number six to check out constraint tutorials and the other resources for this tutorial. If you made it to the end of this tutorial, then please let me and the rest of the community know by commenting below what cool project you're currently working on in Fusion 360 and or comment below with another dimensioning tip that you think everyone should know. As always, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch this tutorial. If you enjoyed this tutorial, please click that thumbs up icon and click on that playlist in the lower right hand corner to watch more Fusion 360 sketch tutorials. To be part of the Product Design Online community, be sure to click that red subscribe button and click that little bell icon to be notified of more Fusion 360 tutorials.